welcome to the Faculty Forum Online, a program of the MIT Alumni Association, sponsored in part by MIT Professional Education. I'm your moderator, Judy Cole, Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association. We will be taking your questions today for, uh, for our professor guest, and so please use the, block, the box below the live stream to enter them, and we'll get as many as possible. Our guest is Professor Richard Binzel, Professor of Planetary Sciences and Margaret McVicker Faculty Fellow for the Department of Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences at MIT. He is also a Joint Professor of Aerospace Engineering and a faculty affiliate with the MIT Kavli Institute. Professor Binzel has been co-investigator on NASA's first mission to Pluto and the Kuiper, and the Kuiper Belt better known as the New Horizons mission. He is also an expert on eclipses and will lead an MIT alumni travel program to Idaho this August to observe the first total solar eclipse visible from the United States in 26 years. Professor Benzel, welcome. Thank you, Judy. I hope you will start us off with some show and tell, giving us an overview of some of the impressive highlights of this past year's work. That'd be my pleasure to do that. And uh, I brought some slides, as professors will do. And we'll um, talk about four missions, because as it turns out, I'm now working on four spacecraft missions for NASA. And sometimes they get a little. Simultaneously? Simultaneously. So sometimes they get a little whiplash as they go around the solar <laughs> system. But to start off, if we look at this first slide, I think people are aware that uh, back in July of 2015, we for the first time had a spacecraft go by Pluto. As you said, it's the New Horizons mission. And the spectacular thing about Pluto, we know this amazing heart-shaped feature on its surface that we call Tomba Regio, named after the discoverer. But what that is is a flat nitrogen ice glacier. It's as if Pluto is alive. Who would know that the farthest planetary world out there is actually alive? This is a flowing gl glacier of nitrogen ice that's even kind of bubbling up from its inside. And we don't see any craters on that surface and that uh, craters happen all the time, impacts hit planetary surfaces all the time. And if you see a surface that's empty of craters, it means something has to be renewing it. It's kind of like a Zamboni, you know, finishing, uh, you know, resurfacing the ice at Boston Garden. Um, and MIT has a little piece of real estate. There's a crater down there at the bottom uh, center named Elliott Crater after an MIT professor, James Elliott, who was a mentor to many Pluto scientists. In, fa in fact, two of the deputy Scientists on the New Horizons mission, Leslie Young and Kathy Olkin, are students, MIT PhDs, and uh, so MIT has a big role in the New Horizons mission and even real estate on Pluto. <laughs> so that's Pluto. Uh, more recently, this is our more recent launch, and this is um, MIT uh, hardware, or even fingerprints, so we clean the instrument before we launch it. Uh, MIT students actually built a shoebox sized instrument on this NASA mission called OSIRIS-REx. It's an asteroid sample return mission. And this shoebox sized regolith X-ray imaging spectrometer, uh, what it will do is it will, we will go to the asteroid and we'll look to see how that asteroid glows in X-ray light in response to how the sun, X-rays from the sun, hit that asteroid surface. So the picture there is some of our student team as we got down to uh, Cape, uh, Cape Kennedy back in September. And there's our launch uh, on uh, September uh, 8th on an Atlas V rocket. The OSIRIS-REx mission logo has MIT on it because uh, we're partnering this mission with this instrument. And so I think it's the largest MIT rocket ever launched. I think the Rocket Club launches a few rockets here and there, but I don't think they've ever launched anything quite this big. Anyway, so MIT was on the side of the OSIRIS-REx mission, the Atlas V rocket. And we think that's pretty neat. Excellent PR. <laughs> a great PR. We're now in space. Uh, I've got two more missions. Uh, so those are the things that are now in space. I've got another one we'll launch in 2021. This is a ridiculously complicated diagram. It's kind of a ridiculously complicated mission, but it's spectacular in that there are sets of asteroids that have been trapped in this location in the outer solar system near Jupiter called Trojan asteroids. Uh, and for the people who love this stuff, they're at the Lagrange points, something called Lagrange points, L4 and L5 of Jupiter. That'd be a great thing to do a web search on. 
And uh, these asteroids that are in these regions, we think have been there since the beginning of the solar system, 4.6 billion years ago. And we're gonna go uh, la uh, uh, launch in 2021, do a loop around the Earth, get out to Jupiter, go through that uh, Trojan cloud, come back, do a second loop around Jupiter, and go to the other Trojan cloud. And that, goes, that mission goes into the 2030s. So that's a cause for eating lots of vegetables and, and uh, Getting plenty of exercise. Getting plenty of exercise, yes. That's uh, got plenty of time for that, too. Uh, and then finally, the fourth mission I'm on is called Psyche, which is a launch in 2023. It's led by Lindy Elkins Tanton, another MIT PhD, uh, who is now at Arizona State University in Tempe. And uh, we launched in 2023. Psyche is the name, actually the name of a mission and the name of an asteroid. It's a metallic asteroid. We think it's like the metal core of a planet, a little planet that used to be in the asteroid belt that got broken apart and all that's left behind is that iron core. And this is our chance to see what the inside of a planet looks like. So we're very excited about looking at the inside of a planet with this uh, Psyche mission. Uh, so those are the four missions I'm on uh, and it, uh, it keeps me busy. So some of those distances you were talking about are incredible. How do you ever explain something on that scale to your students? It's, it's really hard even when you do this for a living to, uh, to get it all in your head. And something I, I like to do is I like to challenge my students with the concept of if you tried to fit the solar system into the infinite corridor. And so imagine that. And lobby seven is the sun, and at the other end of the corridor is Pluto. How big is the sun? So we could have, have a contest and let people think about it, but the answer is right here. The sun in the infinite corridor on that scale is as big as a softball. And Pluto, I'm sorry, so the sun is this size. The Earth, if this is an arm span, the Earth is about three arm spans away, so I'll keep it on camera, and the Earth, I'm sure it doesn't show up on my little card here, uh, is a one millimeter BB uh, about uh, five meters away from the sun in the infinite corridor. And so you can enter the infinite corridor and in a few steps, walk by the Earth, and then Pluto's all the way at the other end of the infinite corridor. And what size would Pluto be? So Pluto's an even pinprint, tinier, pinprint. Uh, yes, indeed, a tinier dot than the Earth. So Anyway, I just really love that idea. And every time I walk down the infinite corridor, I'm thinking about, oh my gosh, we went from all the way from this end, from lobby seven to the other end and our spacecraft worked and it worked flawlessly. It's just, it's men's at menace, really, <laughs> um, really amazing, amazingly at work. And, um, you know, and in this whole, to sort of segue into another topic, it's in this whole scheme of things for uh, the, the scale of this, um, the moon, which is about uh, less than an inch away, a few centimeters away from the Earth, I didn't draw it on my card. Uh, there are times when the moon lines up and it manages to block the sun. There's the Earth. Oh, I see. So uh, yeah. for our um, viewers, I will tell you, he has a tiny BB scotch taped to this Wouldn't uh, want to lose card. it. Wouldn't want to lose so it. So that's why he keeps holding this up, because it is really tiny. <laughs> Just trust me. Trust me, it's there. <laughs> So, um, but there are times when the moon, which is about, uh, about two centimeters away towards the sun, uh, will block the sun uh, as viewed from the Earth and we get a total solar eclipse. And that's something that'll happen on August 21st, as you mentioned in mm. your intro. So, thank you. Um, a reminder to our viewers that we are taking your questions this hour, so use the box below the live stream to ask questions of Professor Benzel. And speaking of the eclipse, we're starting with some video questions from alumni today. And the first one is about that very subject. It comes from Helen from Carlisle, Mass. Are there specific things that researchers are hoping to learn from this year's, from observing this year's eclipse? And also, are you personally going to be involved in any of the research? I know it's slightly outside your uh, current uh, areas of interest, but uh, I was just wondering. Thanks a lot. Well, Helen, it's great to see you. <laughs> um, 
So for the total solar eclipse uh, coming up, I'm more or less a tourist or a tour guide mm -hmm. in the sense of trying to make sure our group uh, understands everything about eclipse, about eclipse safety, um, but really understanding the details of what happens during the eclipse. So um, um, for me personally, I'm not involved as a scientist. Uh, I find these events just amazing to watch and experience. It's a full uh, natural experience, almost unnatural experience when an eclipse happens. How many solar eclipses have you seen? So uh, in t August of this year, we number six, the sixth total solar eclipse. Wow. So we have another uh, video question coming from Thomas in Boston. Uh, what has the New Horizons mission taught us about ice and water in the solar system? Wow, what a great question. Um, I think what we found is, among the ama amazing things we found, a lot of Pluto is water ice. Um, in that image I showed, there are even mountains on Pluto. And those mountains are about 3,000 to 4,000 meters high, or about 14,000 feet, as high as the Rockies. And they're made of water ice. And I, I think what we're finding is that water is very abundant everywhere in the solar system. Which, which is k kind of what we knew or what we expected, but now as we explore, we're really seeing it almost literally in our faces. And hydrogen and oxygen are two of the most abundant elements in the universe, so maybe it's not a surprise we see water everywhere, but uh, it's that abundance of water that uh, really leads us to think that uh, the, the, the ingredients for life really are everywhere we look. Except it needs to be a little warmer, I imagine. I, yes. <laughs> Anytime I think it's cold in Cambridge, I just think about the temperatures on Pluto, <laughs> <laughs> about minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's and it makes me feel better here in Cambridge. So I have a third question here. Your biography says that you published your first scientific paper when you were 15 years old. Uh, what was its title? And is it easier or harder today for a 15-year-olds to publish than it was for you? Wow, uh, you've done some digging, I can see. <laughs> um, the title of that paper was The Rotation of Asteroid 18 Melpomene. Just why not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so it's all about how asteroids spin and how fast they spin and things like that, which is interesting to know. But I think today it's actually a little bit easier uh, to publish things because th the state of equipment, uh, the, these, the CCD, the digital cameras we have on our iPhones were, uh, are now um, available to be put on the back end of even small telescopes. And there's what amateur astronomers can do with modern camera, digital camera equipment on modest sized telescopes eclipses, there's that word again, <laughs> eclipses what professional astronomers could do 10 or 20 years ago. Wow. So there really is a renaissance in the kind of science that can be done with small telescopes. Fascinating. And many high school students now are routinely uh, making observations with their high school observatories. Yeah. Well, and of course there's the capacity to self-publish as well through the internet. Right. You, of course. Digital publishing counts. Of course, of course. So, um, <clears throat> Jane in Newton asks, can you talk more specifically about MIT's role in the Psyche mission? Well, MIT's role in the Psyche mission. So, uh, as I said, the PI is uh, Dr. Lindy Elkin-Stanton, uh, MIT PhD, out of Course 12. And we have also on board that mission uh, Professor Ben Weiss in my department, who is helping to build a magnetometer. We're going to study the magnetic field of that. Uh, of that asteroid, this metallic asteroid. And our um, vice president for research, um, Maria Zuber, is on board that mission. And she's an expert in trying to decode the inside of planetary bodies based on their gravity fields. So there are three MIT faculty involved in the Psyche mission uh, to try to, to get out there and uh, really take a look at what, uh, what an inside of a planet looks like. Again, it's something we've never been able to see before. So we're very excited about uh, this chance to look at this inside of a planet. Is the inside of that planet similar to what you would expect the inside of the Earth to be if we had gotten caught in an asteroid belt and broken into bits? That's it. Uh, that's exactly the motivation. Now, this was a smaller planet than the Earth ever was that, that formed there. But 
uh, this is as close as we're going to be able to get to looking inside what's the structure of the mm -hmm. inside of the Earth by going to this asteroid. So it's really a fascinating idea. Yeah. It's been on my wish list for a long time, and we finally got a Ma NASA mission to go there. So Mark in New York City asks, the New Horizons mission was notable for being heavily populated by female scientists. Mm -hmm. What do you think made that worth noting? Why is this mission distinct among an otherwise male-dominated profession? So the New Horizons, the fact that we have so many women on the New Horizons mission, um, was something that the media caught on to because the, we were doing a lot of interviews and the reporters were comparing notes and they said, I just interviewed the deputy, uh, the deputy project scientist and it was a woman. And they said, well, I just have to interview the chief of mission operations. It was a woman. And they're kind of scratching their heads. It's like, wait a minute. And it turns out about 30 to 40 percent of the New Horizons team are women, which is about the percentage of women now working in this field. And as I like to say, I don't think we were really deliberate and really trying to do anything extra special other than just being diligent and hiring the best people. And so uh, to me, it's, it's a nice... Um, outcome in the sense that maybe the pipeline is getting a little bit better. I don't want to say we're complacent in the least, mm. but it looks like the pipeline is having some effect and we are making some progress. Are you seeing that same proportionality reflected in the current student body or the way you admit your graduate students, things like that? Well, in fact, I think in planetary science we are women dominated now in terms of being much greater than 50%. That's just how it so happens. To uh, to be right now, but mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we are seeing a lot of progress being made. And as I said, we're not complacent in the least, but it is nice once in a while to see some confirmation that we must be doing a few things right, at least at this point. So Tom in North Carolina wants to know what the scale factor for your infinite corridor model of the solar system, maybe 15 billion to one? Oh yeah, I haven't thought about that number. Uh, boy, I haven't thought about that number, um, so I'm, I'm not going to try to do math live on, on Well, just on air. Take, it, take Tom's word for it. But that's okay. That's a good number. It's, uh, it's about five uh, meters per AU. So. Chuck in Sunnyvale, California says, I'm driving to the eclipse path in Idaho. What equipment best captures the event? Oh, that's great. So let's go to a slide here. I'm going to, let's give you a little detailed uh, information on the eclipse. So this is the path of the total solar eclipse on August 21st, it's a Monday, and that, that ribbon that goes across the United States is the place to be if you want to see the sun totally eclipsed by the sun. Uh, uh, if I you want to see the moon totally eclipsing the sun, thank you, get my verbs right, and uh, everywhere else you'll see a partial eclipse and I can't emphasize enough the difference between what you see if it's a partial eclipse and what you see if it's a total eclipse. All of North America will see a partial eclipse. Everywhere you are in North America you will see part of the Sun blocked by the moon. If you get into that sh narrow shadow path you'll see the Sun totally eclipsed by the moon. And uh, let me just give as an example the difference between a partial eclipse and a total eclipse. This is a, uh, effectively what you'll see here in Cambridge on August 21st, that at, uh, in the late afternoon you'll see the first bite taken out of the sun there on the left, and then at uh, just before 3 o'clock, uh, about 60% of the sun will be covered by the disk of the moon, and then slowly that bite will reverse itself and uh, we'll see the sun uncovered. That's what you see when there's a partial eclipse. You see that there's a bite taken out of the sun. It looks like an eyelash moon. And it does. <laughs> Here's what happens when you see a total solar eclipse. If you're in that path, in just in that narrow path, you see the moon completely blocking the sun, and you go from day to night in just a few seconds and the brightness around you changes by a factor of a million. And I'm not exaggerating. Wow. It's a million times better to be in that narrow total eclipse path than seeing a partial eclipse. 
So if you have friends, you have relatives that live in that eclipse path, go there. Go there a few days in advance. There could be eclipse jams, people trying to get there. And if you don't have friends and you don't have relatives living in that eclipse path, make some, <laughs> find some, <laughs> invent that uncle that you, long lost uncle that you always miss. So the, uh, getting in the eclipse path is really worth the effort. Uh, there has not been an eclipse like this going across the United States since 1918. Wow. That was an auspicious year for the Red Sox. Mm. And the last time an eclipse even touched the United States was 1979. So this is an event worth, worth going after. Worth making an effort to Make see. an effort to get into the eclipse path and plan ahead. Yeah. Plan ahead. So moving along with our questions from alumni, Craig in Marlboro, Mass., as, asks if you can talk more about the jockeying among researchers involved in getting equipment or research onto a NASA mission. Have there been missions that your work has been turned down for, and if so, why? Oh, I have a drawer, <laughs> <laughs> almost a file cabinet full of mission proposals that just didn't make it. The New Horizons mission, for example, we, we had five tries. Uh, we got go ahead from NASA to start a design, and then we'd move forward, move, move forward, and then they'd say, ah, oh, thank you very much, you're canceled. Or, sorry, the budget um, just isn't there, et cetera, et cetera. Five different times we got, it's like Lucy. And then they always restart you. Yeah, well, pretty much. And it's like Lucy holding the football, <laughs> all right? So five times we ran up to kick the football, kick the football, yank away. And the sixth time it managed to stay put. And among the reasons why the football stayed put is the discovery of the Kuiper Belt, the discovery that Pluto is not alone out beyond Neptune. It's a whole zone of new bodies, leftover material from the beginning of the solar system. And we began to understand Pluto in a new light, in a new context, and it made the scientific motivation to go there even stronger. And at the same time, as that science motivation in increased, Technology, the Motorola flip phone, the area of the flip phone, and miniaturization of electronics let us put um, enough sophistication into a small spacecraft that we could accomplish an enormous range of scientific objectives in a spacecraft the size of a grand piano. And wow. that's what New Horizons is. It's a grand piano that we launched at 30 kilometers a second to go past Pluto. I love the analogies you make. They get, they, they're so vivid. Um, Adrian in Washington asks, where are alumni of your lab from the last 30 years today? What roles have they gone on to hold and what projects of theirs make you most proud? Wow, what a great question. So uh, well, I'm incredibly proud of my mission, our mission PIs on New Horizons, as I mentioned, Leslie Young, Kathy Oaken, um, as uh, deputy PIs on the New Horizons mission, our Lindy Elkin-Stanton, our PhD, who's now leading the Psyche mission. Um, we have uh, students from our department go to all uh, their earth sciences and atmospheric sciences, sciences and so they go uh, to various other universities, to national laboratories, um, and so they kind of go all over. But in the space business, a lot of them have gone on to jobs at uh, JPL, uh, NASA Goddard, um, uh, Lincoln Labs is a place where many students go. And um, I'm just proud when they uh, might, you know, they, they, they grow up <laughs> into these <laughs> leadership roles. It, it, I think those are my proudest moments, mm -hmm. is seeing, seeing this next generation of leaders uh, come forward. And in fact, on the New Horizons mission, the youngest member of the team is my graduate student, a woman named Alyssa Earle, uh, was the, is, uh, I think, still the youngest member on the New Horizons team. And, uh, and there was a speech to the Senate, on the Senate floor by, by uh, Senator Markey. Uh, commenting about the New Horizons mission and Alyssa Earle and MIT having the, the youngest uh, active member of the science How old team. Is there. She? Well, she's in her early 20s now, but she's, uh, she's a graduate student still. Wow. And already wow. publishing papers on the New Horizons spacecraft results. It sounds, from all these people working on different NASA missions, it sounds like we sort of have a NASA mafia down well, there. Well, we, we um, I don't have it in my slide package, but at the New Horizons mission, we took a photo of all the assembled MIT grads who uh, were either working on the mission or had uh, c um, connections to the mission uh, or connections to Pluto science. And there was a very, very big group. That's wonderful. Amy in Brooklyn asks, um, 
Can you talk about your relationship with Alan Stern? What do you admire most about him? Alan Stern. So Alan, just to, to put it in the con into context, Alan Stern is the principal investigator, the leader of the New Horizons mission. And the most admirable uh, quality of Alan is he never quits. <laughs> He's unstoppable. He's an unstoppable force of nature. As I said, we went through these five different cancellations. We worked for nearly 20 years uh, to get the new, uh, mission to Pluto onto the launch pad. And wow. then it was almost 10 years of flight to get across the solar system from one end of the infinite corridor to the other uh, to get to Pluto. And so many times along the way, there just seem to be these insurmountable roadblocks. And a lot of us would s start to say, oh, we, oh, oh, this is too hard. We're not ever going to do it. And Alan would never let go. And Alan would never give up. So uh, all credit to Alan and his, his perseverance really is a very admirable quality. And, and that's how we got, that's how we got, that's how we have seen Pluto now. So often Thanks in life, that. that's what it takes. It is, it is. Elizabeth in Buffalo asks, are there projects U.S. researchers envy that the Chinese Space Agency or European Space Agency are undertaking, but that NASA can't fund? Wow. Um, boy, that's a tough one to how to say. I think it's just the energy. I don't know, you know, we're, we're, we're still ahead. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's the rate of growth. I think if there's something that we envy, it's the rate of growth. Um, uh, yeah, I'll use the word aggressive um, in a kind way, I mean, in a good yeah, way, yeah. that uh, is the fact that they're aggressively trying to grow their space program and we're kind of where we are and, just, you know, sometimes we go up, sometimes we go down, sometimes we go up, go, go down. And so the fact that there is this aggressive dedication to continual improvement and continually advancing their space program, and not that we aren't too, we certainly, we never are complacent but uh, it's just the rate of growth of their space pro program, mm -hmm. I think, is uh, the, what, what is exciting. I wouldn't, no, wouldn't say the word envy. I would say it's, it's exciting to watch. Devon in Pasadena asks, or Devon, I'm not sure which, um, what work remains for New Horizons? What do you and your co-investigators hope to learn about MU69, for oh, instance? Oh, wow, great question. All right, so uh, New Horizons, because we wanted to get to Pluto in the lifetime of a spacecraft, which is 10 or 20 years. Eventually things just don't work anymore. And we're selfish as scientists. We wanted to still be alive when we got there too. <laughs> and so, so we had to go very fast. We had to put this piano-sized uh, spacecraft on the biggest NASA rocket and give all, put all the velocity of the rocket into a, a small uh, spacecraft. So there was no way we could carry enough fuel to slow down and stop because then the rocket uh, would be too much mass on the spacecraft. The rocket couldn't launch all that mass. So that's a long way of saying uh, the New Horizons mission is a flyby. Mm -hmm. Flying by, flown past Pluto, we will leave, eventually leave the solar system. And, um, and in, in the process now of going past Pluto on into the Kuiper belt, we will go by an object that is named MU, 2014 MU69. It's a household word. And it's just a <laughs> designation for this object discovered in 2014. It's maybe 30, 40 miles across. Um, that, but that's all we know. We don't, it's like a really big comet that's, that just lives in the outer solar system. And so it's gonna be pure exploration just to see what these icy, bodies are like. We think it's just a leftover piece from the very beginning of our solar system. So interesting. Dennis in Arlington <clears throat> asks, could you, Arlington, Massachusetts, could you please comment on the evidence for the existence of Planet Nine, which I've heard may be massive but not yet detected? Mm -hmm. So Planet Nine is an idea that uh, there are some Maybe some, un, uh, some unusual properties of the way these objects in the Kuiper belt uh, are positioned and oriented and where they reside in their orbits. That is if there's something else kind of tugging on them. And so this is the latest. The, the road of planetary predictions is littered by burning hulks off to the side. And here's the latest idea, which actually looks really good, very interesting. So we're going to keep our fingers crossed on this one. So. Um, 
so it's hard. The, 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 the inferences are, are hard to really pin down with a lot of specificity. And, um, and the, but the searches are underway. We kind of know where, where we can be looking and what we, uh, you know, what it might take to pick this thing out if it's there. And uh, we'll just let the process unfold. The science, the science will give science will give us the answer, uh, one way or another, sooner or later. And so it's it's uh, it's a TBD or it's a t to be continued. It's a work in progress, but very very interesting. Very interesting. <coughs> PJ in West Hartford, Connecticut, asks: uh, NASA's discovery program seems to be aimed at investing broadly in many lower cost missions like Psyche. Do you approve of this budget strategy? Well, well, if only I were king. <laughs> <laughs> so the discovery, uh, to put that in some context, the discovery program is a NASA program where uh, um, university uh, uh, researchers can uh, design a mission. There's a budget cap of about, I'll say, $650 million. That's probably not exactly the right number. But there's a budget cap. And then you try to say, what's the best science we can fit into a mission in that budget cap? And it turns out that, that asteroids, the, these objects, this, many of them are near the Earth, the near-Earth asteroids. Sometimes they hit us and they wipe out dinosaurs. And so it's kind of a good thing that we understand those. But there's also this uh, enormous abundance of them between Mars and Jupiter in the main asteroid belt. It turns out in that budget category, missions that can go to the asteroid belt are very mature. In other words, we know how to do this. The technology is ready uh, to uh, execute these kind of missions. And so if we can uh, dis make descriptions of valuable science rationale, like going to see the metallic core, going a way of looking at the inside of the Earth that we can never do any other way, and we can do it in this budget, and we can say, and our capability, technology capability, is, it's right in our wheelhouse. That makes a very compelling argument. So, uh, so in discovery, I'm very open to trying to explore Venus, for example, the moon. We've just explored the moon. We've explored comets in the discovery program. And um, anyway, I'm very open to almost any science question myself that would fit in, even if it's not my specialty. I think there's still a lot of really great uh, research it can do, one can do. And the beauty of the discovery program and then a larger program called New Frontiers is that it's all competitive. So you get a dozen or two dozen proposals and the competition really helps make sure that the best proposals win. Mm. It forces you to Yeah, well, it. that's right. Competition is good. Yeah. Charlie in Cambridge uh, says, I read that over 50 students at MIT worked on the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft. How specifically did they contribute? Wow. So um, this was the RExis instrument that we're flying on board the OSIRIS-REx mission. So this is our shoebox-sized X-ray spectrometer. And we uh, germinated that idea in a class, 1683, Space, space Systems Engineering, which I'm now teaching uh, this semester. Uh, with a different mission idea for something we'll do in 2029. And uh, so it initiated in a class, 1683, where we said, where we were, it was a competition actually. It was a competition among universities to design an instrument um, for $8 million that could go on board and, uh, and had to be designed and built by students. And, and so this is, this is really a case where it was, it's MIT at its best because it was the combination of the School of Engineering, the School of Science, so Aeroastro and Earth and Planetary Science, Lincoln Labs, the Kavli Institute, um, uh, all working together in trying to um, bring this design together. But uh, so the design was initially done by students, and this is also a collaboration with Harvard, of all places. <laughs> Great co colleagues at Harvard who've contributed to this. So we had our in initial design, we uh, then let the students uh, fine-tune many aspects of the design, test the thermal electronics, uh, and they were um, literally building the thing, designing and building the thing, uh, with a little bit of adult supervision around the edges. Wow, that's remarkable. It, that is just anyway, remarkable. It's really what a, a fabulous experience. It, it is, and we, we go to reviews, and the, we'd work with our NASA engineering colleagues, 
and they'd, the students would be presenting and showing their ideas and their concepts, and they would pull me off to the side and they'd say, why didn't I get to do that when I was a student? <laughs> That's how I knew we were doing something really special. <laughs> there you go. Pace in Cambridge asks, are there any useful amateur observations alumni could make once we travel to a total eclipse site without distracting too much from the experience of being there? Wow, I think that probably the science, the big science is probably left to the people who are investing uh, in, a, in a lot, uh, in pretty sophisticated ex ex uh, equipment. My best advice is just experience it. Go travel to the total solar eclipse and just experience it. Uh, it is so overwhelming that you can't, you can't take it all in. You cannot take it all in. The fact of how the brightness changes instantly when that last little sliver of the sun is covered. You see the corona, the outer halo of the sun burst out. It gets dark. Stars appear in the sky. The birds go to sleep. The temperature drops. The wind picks up. People are screaming. It, it, it's the most odd, amazing, natural thrill ride uh, that happens. And millions of people can be on that ride at once because that eclipse path goes all the way across. And how long does it last? So in any given spot, it's about two and a half minutes. Wow. So it's going to be this shared roller coaster experience that will first start on the, in, on the west coast and that two and a half minute central p uh, path of the moon will, will follow that, tr that ribbon across the United States until uh, sometime in the afternoon when it leaves, leaves um, the east coast. Fabulous. So Anne in San Mateo asks, how is New Horizons still being powered today given uh. how far away it is now from Earth and the sun? Is it all gravity assist power? Oh, uh, well, uh, in space you keep going forever. There's no friction, so in terms of once you give it velocity. But the spacecraft does have to have electrical power to operate the instruments, and it's a trick question in the <laughs> sense that how do you power a spacecraft to Pluto in terms of giving it electrical power? Right, because aren't you so far away that yeah, solar, solar power? Yeah, the solar panels don't work. Yeah. So the way you power a Pluto mission is with plutonium. And I was once asked this question in an airport security line. <laughs> I live to tell the tale. <laughs> That's too funny. Who asked you? Uh, the TSA agent. I was wearing my, uh, my New Horizons lapel pin, and, uh, and uh, he, uh, said, he recognized me. He says, is that that New Horizons mission? I said, yeah. And he says, do you know about that? I said, well, I'm on, you know, working on doing this for a long time, blah, blah, blah. Well, how do they operate it out there? It's too cold, and you don't have... Solar panels, do you? No, no. Well, what do you use? Um, radioisotopes. <laughs> and he persisted, and I eventually had to say, well, plutonium. <laughs> <laughs> I lived to tell the tale. I was for sure the, the, the sirens would go off, the net would drop, and I would be taken to the special room. <laughs> Did you have it on you or something? <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't just, care. Just the pin. Uh, just the pin. That's right. No. All right. Um, <clears throat> so back to our alumni questions. Jason in New York. Are there ways that other amazing work at MIT, I'm thinking of TRAPPIST-1 mm -hmm. and the gravitational waves, inform your research? Boy, so my research is really all about this solar system and what's in our own backyard. Um, but uh, as we learn about planets around other stars and other solar systems, it really helps inform how different or, or similar our solar system is to, to everywhere else. And so I think the way it does is finding planets around other stars really helps put our own solar system in context. So it's not a direct link of taking one bit datum from here and putting it there, um, but it's really trying to understand that big context of how do planetary systems form and evolve. So, so we try to step back and look at our solar system as a system and far away we, we're discovering systems. So we know our system in detail and the faraway systems were just beginning to get detail. And eventually we'll have this merger of the detail we know about our own system, the detail we'll know about other systems. And uh, the, anyway, it's just getting ex more exciting by the mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. and why one system develops one way and another one a different Absolutely. way. Absolutely, and why in some ways our solar system may be a little bit odd in some ways. A lot of solar systems like to have a lot of Jupiters or a lot of big Jupiters and they like to be really close to their stars and ours is kind of comfortably parked away. 
So we're, and the more we learn, the more we understand how our solar system is similar or bizarre. Mm. KD in Portland, I don't know if that's Maine or Oregon, um, your bio says an asteroid is named after you. <laughs> Where is that asteroid now? Oh, well, it's happily in the main belt between <laughs> Mars and Jupiter, <laughs> last time I checked. <laughs> And uh, so it's... Uh, Do you know where your asteroid is? <laughs> got to be careful with that one. <laughs> so, um, no, uh, asteroids, uh, they get discovered and you, they don't get named, you don't name them after yourself. Someone has to go to the trouble and saying, you know, the, something you've done has been a contribution to the field. And uh, so anyway, a colleague in so Arizona... It's a nice honor. ...was very kind. It was a very kind thing that a colleague named Ted Bull did for me once upon a time. Mm -hmm. So, I, is this our last question? I think it is. Um, Ted in Anchorage asks, can you give us an outline of the eclipse tour itinerary you will be leading to Idaho in August? Well, I can give uh, uh, some details in the sense that we'll be in central Idaho for a few days before the eclipse. Uh, we will move into the eclipse path or very close to the eclipse path uh, just uh, the night before so that on the morning of the eclipse uh, we can position ourselves very well. And so. Um, you know, you can look at the eclipse path and we're trying to get to a, a place where it's going to be uh, relatively dry, the chances of uh, not very many clouds. Um, and even if you're someplace uh, looking at the eclipse and uh, it's cloudy, you'll still experience that nightfall. So it's, it's really spectacular either way. Okay. Um, on behalf of the MIT Alumni Association, Rick, thank you for joining us today. And thanks to our MIT alumni tuning in and for your wonderful questions. Alumni who wish to order special MIT glasses for the viewing of the solar eclipse this summer, check out the final slide for instructions on how to order, uh, order a pair. You'll be able to find the archive of this conversation along with past faculty talks on the MIT Alumni Association website. Please join us next month for another session of Faculty Forum Online. Have a great afternoon. Bye.